screen user. Artificial intelligence, AI, will change the global economy just as electricity did. During this presentation, Song Won Sun, a LASERS trustee and a professor at Loyola Marymount University, will discuss the impact AI will have on global economics, privacy issues, 5G technology, and the U.S. job market. Please welcome Dr. Song Won Sun. Well, that was the shortest introduction I've ever had. Yes. <laughs> How are you? Morning. All right, so uh, are you excited? No? Gosh. Well, we can have fun this morning. But let me uh, introduce myself again because she uh, really didn't give me a long introduction. I was born and raised in uh, Korea. And uh, I went to a place called the University of Florida. First, uh, all right, Gators here? Huh? <laughs> all right. And uh, it was first year, uh, around the Christmas time, a friend of mine, Sammy, called me and said, hey, son, uh, would you like to come to my Christmas Eve party? So I said, ah, that's great. I'd like to see it, what an American Christmas Eve party is like. He said, I'll come and pick you up. And he came to my dormitory and picked me up. And then he brought his wife along. And he said, son, I'd like you to meet my wife, Heather. So I said, how do you do? We were driving along to his house. And uh, I was trying to remember what her name was. Uh, uh, I was uh, fresh off the boat. Uh, I've heard of names like Bob or Shirley, but never Heather. But I knew he began with H something. And then all of a sudden, he started calling her Honey. So I thought, ah, that must be her name. Anyway, he never invited me back again. Uh, <laughs> this morning, uh, what I really want to talk about is, uh, well, instead of uh, artificial intelligence, I, I wanted to, uh, but uh, Hank wouldn't let me. But uh, I used to be a vice chairman of the board of a company called uh, Forever 21. Have you heard of a company called Forever 21? It's a woman's apparel firm. So I consider myself an expert in latest fashion. So you ladies, if you want some advice at the end of uh, the session, uh, you know, line up here, okay? <laughs> well, I better get to work here. Artificial intelligence, digital economy. Only 12 years ago, uh, Steve Jobs introduced this uh, iPhone, remember that? And just think about all the things that have changed. I can promise you the next 12 years is going to be equally more interesting, exciting, and breathtaking. And I'm quite sure of that. In fact, in the next 12 years, I don't care what business you are in, you will either disrupt someone or you are going to be disrupted in the economy. Or you could innovate. If you do not innovate, you ain't going to be around very long. And that's how difficult competition is going to be. An economist named uh, Joseph Schumpeter, he many years ago talked about so-called creative destruction. And he wrote a book. What did he mean by creative destruction? Well, he, say, he says, you know, we used to have horses and buggies and automobiles came and of course uh, got rid of the horses and buggies, right? Remember Sears? Remember Kodak? They're not around anymore. When you talk about creative destruction, look at all the companies that you see here. From Bloomberg, Netflix, Airbnb, Amazon, Expedia, and of course, uh, even here in Hilton Hotel, we're talking about huh? some uh, significant change because of uh, the Airbnb. Creative, creative destruction, this is an ongoing phenomenon. This is how the economy operates. This is how our productivity, our standard of living goes up because we do engage in creative destruction. I'm saying that artificial intelligence, this is a very important part of uh, Professor Joseph Schumpeter's uh, creative destruction. So today, I want to get into 
creative destruction and artificial intelligence. But first, what I'm going to do is uh, we are going to get on a helicopter and get up about 10,000 feet. I'm an economist. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be talking about uh, writing codes. Uh, that's too much for me and for you, for, for you. So we'll get on a helicopter and then see what the landscape is and how artificial intelligence that could be used to raise productivity. I say uh, AI, that is going to be the electricity, as I pointed out. It is going to be a disruptor or you will be disrupted. And in fact, I can tell you that this is the 20th century, 21st century rather, race to the moon. As an economist, uh, why am I interested in uh, productivity? Very simple. To grow anything, to raise our standard of living, it takes really two things. Number one, bodies, you and me, and how productive you and I are. Unfortunately, productivity gains have been slowing. I don't have time to get into the reasons why, but one of the reasons why I am more optimistic about the future is because of AI. AI that is going to raise productivity, raise our standard of living. You and I are going to live better. Certainly our children, grandchildren, they are going to do better, and that is some of the reasons why I want to talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Later on, I'm going to talk about some uh, education of what AI is and then uh, brief descriptions of uh, how AI operates. But before we do that, I want to get into some examples. Let's go to retail technology called RETAC. FinTech, RETAC, we are talking about retail technology, okay? You've all heard of it, Amazon Gov, Go, right? So let's go to Amazon Gov, Go, not Gov, but Go. Amazon says uh, it will have up to 3,000 Amazon Go stores in the future. So if you look at the stores, uh, it looks like any other store. Before you can go in, they say, well, download your app so that you'll have it on your cell phone. So that's not surprising. That's easy to do. Well, then what do you do? You have to walk through the gates, electronic gates. So you do that, and we do that all the time. And then uh, when you look into the store, it looks like any other store, right? People are milling around looking for what they want to buy. If you look on the shelves, there are ketchups, coffee, fruits, cereals, and uh, all the things that you normally would want at a grocery store. But as soon as you lift a bag of coffee off the shelf, there's a weight scale on the shelf, so the weight scale on the shelf will notice that you've lifted something. And in addition, there are cameras on the ceiling. And camera has been following you, and you are lifting something off the ceiling. So the combination of the camera and the weight scale on the shelf will know exactly what you are buying, and then what you are buying, and then how much that's going to cost. And that's how they operate. So uh, after that, you just walk out. You don't talk to anybody. You just walk out. And then when you walk out, uh, you get a bill like this for a bag of coffee, bottle of water, and uh, chocolate. And at the end, it says uh, the price is what? Uh, $28, $29 on this trip. Well, if you look at this, uh, it is very easy, of course. Uh, you get this immediately on your cell phone right away. But also you'll notice that, you know, prices are pretty good. So what does uh, Amazon get out of this? Well, of course, they're selling food. But what's even more important for Amazon is the data. See? They want to be able to understand what your buying habits are, what you are buying, and when you buy, and how often you buy. They are collecting data. So that next time when you come back, they can pretty much predict what you will buy. In fact, eventually, they want to be able to deliver the whole thing to your house. The data, that's what's important in addition to selling coffee, bottled of water, chocolates, and et cetera. So you can see what Amazon is doing. Well, let's move on. Did you know that if you go to Hong Kong, there's a company called the Vital, owned by a company called the Deep Knowledge Ventures. And uh, they have uh, seven board of directors. One of the board members is, you can see on the screen, that is uh, AI, artificial intelligence, a robot. And in fact, they claim that the robot is much more efficient because it can read the data, information, the books, the newspapers a lot faster than you and I can. Therefore, this robot is a very, very 
intelligent, useful, good uh, board member. So, you know, I can see going forward, in some of the companies, uh, we could have uh, more and more robots as uh, directors. I serve on different boards, and you serve on different boards. You know, 10 years from now, I wouldn't be surprised at all. You and I do what company Vital in Hong Kong does. Let a artificial intelligence have a place in your boardroom. Oakland Athletics, for better lineup, they have used artificial intelligence. And they claim that they had a pretty good success in winning the games. If you go to the University of Santa Clara in California, there was a professor, there is a professor named David Cope. What he did was uh, using artificial intelligence, he composed a Bach, you know, John Sebastian Bach, the music, the classical music. And then here's the actual music. So what he did was uh, he had a concert. At this concert, uh, he had uh, one pianist play real John Sebastian Bach. Another pianist played this uh, John Sebastian Bach composed by artificial intelligence. And then they had a vote. Said, uh, which do you think was the real John Sebastian Bach? Would you believe about 70% of the people thought the AI John Sebastian Bach was a real one? So you can see AI can really do an amazing job. Why? Because it has more information, more data. And uh, I go back to, again as an economist, back to productivity. I wish I had more time to talk about productivity, but this is going to raise productivity and is raising productivity. Also, if you go to China, here's a uh, new China news agency. This fellow is a robot, see? It says, I will work tirelessly to keep you informed as text goes on and on and on. And they say, this guy's great. He doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't complain, he doesn't drink, he doesn't sue you. I mean, you know, what more do you want, see? So we are going to see more and more robots doing broadcasting as well. We all know about 5G, right? You know, 5G is clearly very important. President, Clinton, uh, President Trump is talking about it. You and I are talking about it. Every day we hear about, you know, 5G. So what is this all about? Let's take, uh, like, a highway. This might be downtown Los Angeles, Spaghetti Highway. And we all know our highways are very congested. When you come through Highway 35 in uh, downtown Austin, Texas, we all know during rush hour it is extremely, extremely crowded, right? So when you have a congestion like this, what do you do? Well, essentially there are two things you can do. Number one is increase the speed limit, but there's a limit. I mean, you know, you can't have a speed limit of 120 miles an hour on Highway 35. The other one is uh, add more lanes, and of course that costs money. And that's what 5G is all about. We want to be able to speed up the process. We want to be able to have uh, more lanes so that we can send more data through. And so, first of all, let's talk about the speed. We all know about the chips, and uh, this is not my expertise. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about chips, but of course we are getting more uh, faster chips. And that amounts to increasing the speed limit on uh, Highway 35 in Austin, Texas. Then, as I said, you can add more lanes, right? And that's when this so-called uh, 5G towers come in. Well, normally a 5G tower would have, you see, the antennas, maybe half a dozen antennas, that would be normal, maybe some more, as many as a dozen. But 5G antennas, they could have up to 128 antennas, which means that they could uh, produce, send LAMO data. There's more space. The trunk, the pipeline has gotten bigger, and that's what that 5G is all about. And this is one of the reasons why if you had a 5G with a fast chips and then, of course, uh, more antennas, you can download a movie instead of two hours. You can download it in two seconds, see? And this is one of the benefits of 5G. This is what raises productivity. This is one of the reasons why economists like myself, we are very, very interested in the progress of 5G. It is going to change your and my life. In computer, we all talk about uh, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and et cetera, right? Of course, we all know kilobytes, that is uh, three zeros. 
megabytes, that's uh, six zeros. The gigabytes, that's what? Huh? Nine zeros, right? There's the terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes, and then today, now the scientists are talking about eurobytes. Eurobytes has uh, 24 zeros, 24 zeros. And so that's how fast information will move in the future. That's how we are going to raise productivity. You can see why uh, this is important. That's why the US government and every government on this side of the moon, they are interested in 5G. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the leader in 5G is a Chinese company that we all have been reading about in the paper called uh, 5G. Why, right, see? We've been telling Germans and the British, don't use 5G with why. And the uh, British and Germans are saying, you know what? They've got the best thing going. They've got the best technology. We have to have them, see? Well, so uh, I don't want to get into politics, but you can understand why 5G is important. When you talk about uh, artificial intelligence, also data that is very, very important. Without data, you cannot have artificial intelligence. Simply put, AI simply processes existing data and then tells you what the outcomes are or what you should do. Data, big data, that's very important. So the term is called the big data. So let's talk about big data. There are six uh, benefits of uh, big data. It can give you a lot of, uh, well, when you talk about a bunch of data, scientists that talk about how valuable a piece of data is. How much do you have, the volume, variety, what kind, velocity, how fast can you get it, veracity, uh, veracity uh, how trustworthy is it, and then value, well, of course, how valuable is the data? And variability, how many different ways can you use the data? So when you talk about big data, scientists, they divide it into these uh, six different characteristics. But again, uh, that's not what we want to talk about today. My point is that, remember earlier I talked about the Chinese company called Huawei? You know, they are at the vanguard. They are ahead in big data. And that's one of the concerns that we have in the race to the moon. So let's go to China. Why is China the leader in AI artificial intelligence? You know, when I go to China, when I go to Korea, I get a lot of electricity, I get a lot of excitement. When I come back to America, unfortunately, it's kind of boring. Well, for example, if you go to Beijing, China, this is what you will see on the billboard and the sidewalks. If you get caught jaywalking, well, your pictures will be on the billboards, see, all right? And so a lot of people, they think twice about jaywalking. And uh, you see, a lot of people on the street, they have these numbers. How do you get these numbers? The Chinese policemen, they have so-called the AI-powered smart glasses. And then so, when you put on these glasses, they'll be able to see these people and then each people will have a number. And the number will tell you what your name is, address, and then of course if you have any criminal history, whether you are delinquent, whether you're Muslim, and then all those kind of things, information. So they are using AI, artificial intelligence already. But one problem they do have is uh, in order for these so-called the AI powered glasses to recognize a person, that person has to remain, remain still for four seconds. If you, are keeping, if you keep moving around, well, uh, that may not work uh, quite as accurately. So that's one of the reasons why they won 5G badly. Then you don't have to wait four seconds. They can identify who you are instantaneously. So you can see a lot going on, especially in China. Well, San Francisco said uh, we are going to ban uh, any facial identification. But in China, they are using AI to find out delinquent payers on your bills, and then, of course, uh, Muslim minorities, which is bad. Another issue that we have with AI is uh, privacy. So let's talk about privacy for a minute, because this is important. Economics is important. Efficiency, of course, is important. But also, in this society, privacy that is also important as well, right? So let's talk about privacy. A uh, IT specialist uh, named Paul Oliver Duhay, uh, he's an uh, Englishman. He was looking at his data and uh, read what it says at the bottom. 
It says uh, a company called Amabi that uh, they buy data from predicted that on June 9th, 2019, he's likely to suffer from overactive bladder. So Amobi purchased the data from the weather company owned by IBM, see? And you can see if you were uh, Paul Oliver DeHay, you would be shocked, right? You were just sitting around doing your job, and then all of a sudden someone says, you know what? You are going to have uh, over blood, overactive bladder on June 9th, 2019. That would be pretty shocking, wouldn't it? I mean, think about all the other things that gather about you, see? And then so, but the point is that Amobi that is owned by I, the, the so-called water company, and the water company that, that is owned by none other than IBM, the big blue, see? And so today, everybody's selling data. Everybody's collecting data. You know, uh, early I, I told you that, that one of the reasons why Amazon, they are doing Amazon Go, the grocery stores, because they want the data. And today, there are data brokers, Experian, Oracle, you know, Axiom. You know, these are all well-known companies. Well, they are all collecting data. They are selling data. And uh, Google and Facebook, they are no exceptions. They are doing the same thing. In fact, if you go to a party, it could be a meeting like this. Someone could put an electronic fence and get unique ID from your cell phones. And that will follow home, and then it will be subject to so-called CDTT. Read what it says at the bottom, CDTT. CDTT means uh, cross-device tracking technology to find related computers and then other devices to push ads. Well, now they are trying to push ads, but of course, uh, in China, they could use it for a lot of other reasons as well. So this is how advanced things are. Remember Willie Sutton? Someone asked him, why do you write rob a bank? And he said, well, because that's where the money is, right? I mean, today, Willie Sutton would be robbing not for money, but for data, because that is far more valuable. Data, data, data. You mine data, you sell data, you use data, and data is everything. If you have data, you can have artificial intelligence. If you don't have data, you cannot have artificial intelligence. And this is one of the advantages China has. In America, we have uh, some strict rules or some rules about privacy, right? In China, they do not. The government can collect all kinds of data. They've got more data, therefore, they can be more advanced in AI. In America, we have a lot more restrictions on data, therefore, you know, we're having a difficult time keeping up with China because without data, you cannot really do anything in AI. As I said, I want to give you an education on AI. I'm not going to go into uh, how to write uh, programs, codes. Uh, for that, you will have to talk to my son, who is an AI specialist, uh, at, uh, uh, from a graduate from Columbia. And in fact, I learned quite a, quite a lot from him. But I'm an economist, so we want to talk about AI from, again, remember, we are on a helicopter, OK, from a 10,000 feet level. AI. Uh, has a couple of subsets. One is called the machine learning, and then the other one is called deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, and then machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. So let's talk about that one at a time. First of all, the machine learning. When you talk about machine learning, uh, you know, it is very simple. We build a model. Remember from uh, your Algebra 101, y is equal to a plus bx? So it could be, or Y could be your pension benefits, right? Your pension benefits depends on X, amount of your monthly income. And if you want to make this equation more complicated, you can add another variable called uh, CZ. And the Z could be number of years you've been on the job. So you could say, your pension benefits is a function of uh, two things, X, which is your income, Y, the number of years that you have worked in this job. You know, that's how the artificial intelligence works. Then, of course, we have to have data. The reason is uh, the formula differs in every company, every state, every city, right? So if we had uh, you know, 20 million people in America, how much pension they earn, how many years they work, how much they uh, earn on month monthly basis, you can see we could have an equation. And that is the beginning of uh, an artificial intelligence equation. Of course, I'm way, way over oversimplifying it. But let me give you some examples. Again, 
when you have an equation like that, a simple equation like that, as I pointed out, Amazon, they want to be able to find out your buying habits, your eating habits at grocery stores, so they can get back to you later. Netflix, they do the same thing. They want to be able to recommend movies for you. And there's something called the box fashion. That simply means that today, they are saying, you don't have to go to a store to buy clothes. We will send you a box of uh, clothes that you might like, because we have a pretty good idea as to what your tastes are. So they'll send you a box, and then you open up the box. There are three or five outfits. You try one, you like it, keep it, and you send the rest back. Now, the box fashion uh, industry, how do they find out what you like or dislike? And of course, based on data, your preferences. They've got AI, artificial intelligence. That's how they do it. And here are the top 10, 10 cases for data science and then machine learning. And then uh, I'm not going to go into details, but you can see in healthcare, uh, patient diagnosis, finance, fraud detection, manufacturing, uh, the anomaly detection, retail, inventory optimization, government, uh, smarter services, uh, transportation, demand forecasting, networks, uh, intrusion detection, e-commerce, recommender systems, and the media, interaction and speed, and education, research, insight. So you can see the list goes on and on and on. Now let me go to so-called something called the deep learning. Remember earlier I said deep learning is a subset of uh, machine learning, and the machine learning is a subset of uh, artificial intelligence, right? So let me talk about the uh, machine learning. Machine learning, as I said, is a subset. It simply means uh, you have a lot more equations, see? And uh, not only more equations, but more complicated equations. We're not going to talk about the equations, but uh, and sometimes that is called the neural networks. Our brain is called the neural system, right? And uh, we don't have equations in our brain, but uh, you know it, it's very complicated. We, we all know. So when you put together literally tens and thousands of equations, uh, they say, well, it kind of you know looks like our neural network in our brain. So that's why it's called the neural networks. A bunch of equations, more equations, and more complicated equations. So what do we use deep learning for? We talked about facial recognition, language translation from English to Spanish to Korean to Japanese to the Japanese, and then, of course, play board games like uh, chess games and the Go games. So let me just spend a couple of minutes. Here's a facial recognition. When you look at a person like that, there are literally thousands and thousands of pixels on your face, and then here you see a few, and that's how, that's how we recognize them, a person. Let's say there are 6,000 pixels on your face. Each pixel requires an equation, a more complicated equation. So it might require 6,000 equations or 20,000 equations to be able to recognize your face, and that's what deep learning does. And uh, you, look at, you can look at a cat. So artificial intelligence, uh, the machine learning, can look at a cat and says, you know, I look at this cat, and then using the facial recognition, this is a cat, right? But the problem is that when you put the cat upside down, the AI machine is confused. What is this? It cannot recognize. Why? Because it has not seen enough cats. And that's why you build about 10, 20, 30,000 equations, cat lying in every which way, and then show AI. This is what a cat looks like. This way, that way, upside down, sideways up, running, jogging, sleeping, and et cetera. And now they've got 5,000 equations for a cat. And then when AI sees a cat upside down, they can see, well, now this is a cat. So see, and that's what they do. When you look at a person, they can say, well, not only this is a kid, but also he's happy. He's uh, not feeling so well. He's crying, he's upset, he's jovial. And again, it requires tens and thousands of equations to be able to identify this kid being happy or unhappy. If you go to China, they are using artificial intelligence in classrooms. So by looking at the picture, they say, you know, you know these three kids, kids, they know what they're doing. They are learning. They are excited. They are getting it into their head. But a couple of kids back there, they are lost, confused. They don't know what they're doing. They are wasting their time. And AI, artificial intelligence, can identify that. Language translation is another one. Remember this uh, sign in Google, right? We all have it on our uh, cell phones. 
when you want to translate English to Spanish or vice versa, you go to Google, right? Language translation app. And then so suppose we uh, try to translate this, uh, Shakespeare's to be or not to be, right? To be or not to be. Well, if you use the machine learning, a kind of a simple language translation, since I'm a Korean, I uh, went to the machine and said, uh, translate the to be or not to be into Korean. And then so the direct translation of a to be not to be into Korean was a can happen again. But of course, that's not what it means. See, right? And so what you do is uh, we've got to make this thing more complicated. You need uh, thousands and thousands of equations to be able to translate to be or not to be. And what AI, it will do is it will read the whole book in about uh, a second and a half and be able to understand the meaning and then give you a correct translation of a to be or not to be. I'm sure you heard about uh, the AlphaGo. In China, there is a kind of a chess game, uh, except that it's a lot more complicated. Uh, China, Korea, and Japan is called the Go game, see, the board game like this, right? Okay? And again, I assure you, uh, I played this game myself, but it is a very, very complicated. And uh, the human beings, they're kind of like, uh, you know, the, the, the masters at these games. They're kind of like uh, Tiger Woods and, uh, you know, uh, Kapka, uh, who won the, 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 uh, the, uh, the PGA tournament the, the last weekend. And then so, you know, they're very famous and they make lots of money. Well, they had a competition between uh, AI. And this was uh, IBM Watson, uh, IBM computer called Watson, and then uh, uh, human beings. And then this IBM Watson, they won. And you can kind of see the system, see? And you can see this is just a part of it, but they literally build the thousands and thousands and thousands of equations to understand how to make the next move. And so, in fact, they won. They played uh, six games. The machine won five games, and then uh, the human being, uh, the champion master, won one. Some people say, well, really, IBM Watson, they let this master win, you know, just to save his face, but uh, they would won all six. Uh, so you can see using artificial intelligence. Now, there are, you know, many applications of deep, lear deep learning, and then uh, we're not going to get into that. But I'm, what I'm saying is that when you talk about the artificial intelligence, this is like electricity. This is, it's, this is going to change our lives. It already is and has and will. <laughs> when Thomas Edison first uh, invented electricity, he wanted a demonstration. And uh, his uh, primary supporter was uh, J.P. Morgan, the bank, J.P. Morgan. So he set up electricity uh, in J.P. Morgan's house and uh, invited all the big shots from New York City, which included John D. Rockefeller at the time. John D. Rockefeller, Rockefeller came to J.P. Morgan's house and saw electricity in the house. Most people said, my gosh, this is wonderful. I've never seen anything like that. Can I get this set up in my house? And John D. Rockefeller said, this is awful. I mean, he was, of course, selling kerosene, and he said, this is awful. This is the worst thing I've ever seen, see? Well, of course, uh, you know, John D. Rockefeller, uh, he didn't keep up with the technology. And uh, other people, they did. And you can see why I say, when you talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about new electricity. We are talking about another race to the moon between the United States and uh, other countries such as China. It is going to change our lives. Going back to what I said, productivity. As an economist, or well, for that matter, all economists, we are very, very much interested in artificial intelligence because this is going to affect productivity. If you're producing uh, two digits a day instead of one, oh, I would not digit, but two widgets a day instead of a, one widget yesterday, you have raised your productivity. When you raise your productivity, that means what? You are being more productive, producing more, you are worth more, therefore you should be paid more. When you're paid more, your standard of living goes up. And that's what artificial intelligence, AI, is going to do for you. And uh, so uh, when I talk about uh, this uh, mega trend, I call this mega trends, uh, make sure you do not miss opportunities. Again, it can be manufacturing, it can be hotel business, it can be money management business, as I pointed out, you know, even board members. Someday, you and I are going to be replaced by, well, some of the 